So is that gift bag up here? Oh, it's right here. Um, and so if you get here late, we want you to be here, but 
Uh, just make sure to ring one of the doorbells and Deb will let you in and we're kind of doing that just because of all of this crazy stuff that goes on in our world, right? Uh, we have our rummage sale sorting on Wednesdays from 9 a.m. to noon and if you've got friends and neighbors who have stuff they want to drop off for the rummage sale, uh, they can bring those on uh, Wednesday mornings and they can also bring them Saturday mornings when the men are sorting. Um, and we kind of know between the men and the women which which rummage sale which stuff goes to because they kind of take the big heavy stuff and we do more of the clothes and the books and you know kitchenware and that kind of stuff. Uh, also this is our last week of Bible study and then we're going to take a little break for the summer and this week we're doing Revelation which for whatever reason, seems to be the thing everybody wants to study about, but it's just going to be one week here, and we're going to talk about the different ways we can look at Revelation, um, and why it's kind of a controversial, not really controversial, that's not a good word, but it's something that maybe Christians come at from very different directions, let's put it that way. Um, also, we are still planning to have our community movie nights. Um, we had to cancel it this week because of the technology issues, but hopefully I am getting a new projector that is brighter that will be able to do it at 8 o'clock, and we will be back on track with that. And then also, kind of a thing that came up, although the weather's not really cooperating, is today at 2 o'clock uh, on the sandbar, the south sandbar on Torch Lake, uh, I am doing a blessing of the boats, and so I will be out on the sheriff's boat. Uh, the under sheriff, Kevin Hawk, was very gracious to uh, say we could do that, and so I'll be going out there, and uh, I have some prayers, and then we'll bless the boats with some good old Torch Lake water. Um, so if you can pray that the rain stays away till a little bit later in the day in the evening, that would be great too. And if you've got a boat that you want to come out and get blessed, uh, I would love to see you. Or if you have friends who do, let them know. Um, and it's on the church Facebook page if you want to share it. I believe that is all our opportunities for ministry. Are there any that I missed? Darlene? There is a sign-up sheet in the narthex if you would like to help out and be a greeter. And it is, it is a really difficult job you have to study for months and months for. It's not really. All you just have to do is come in and smile and greet people as they walk in and maybe hand them a bulletin. So uh, if you would like to come and help out in that way, that would be wonderful. <coughs> with that, let's begin our worship with our opening hymn, They'll Know We Are Christians. It's Rise as You Are Able.
Elijah. Lead a life worthy of the calling to which you are called. We cannot do this alone. We dare not try this alone. So we gather as God's people. Lead a life worthy of your calling, a life filled with service and meekness. We come to build up Christ's body in humility and gentleness, with patience and love. Lead a life which reflects your calling, that life of peace grounded in the Spirit. We rejoice in our oneness in Christ. We will share the greatest bonds of us. Live a life worthy of the calling to which you have been called. We gather as God's family and respond to God's call on our lives to be the church of the world for the glory of God. You may be seated. It is children's time. <coughs> So I brought some things from my office. Do you know what these are? What are they, Lillian? Um, they're not supposed to be This is a church. That's pretty good. And feel it. It's a stress ball. <laughs> and do you know who this is? It does kind of look like a president, and he lived about the same time as the first president of our country, George Washington. And it kind of looks like George Washington. But it isn't. It's John Wesley. And so, you know, some days when I'm having a hard pastor day, I got a stress ball in each hand, and one's John Wesley and one's the church. Uh, I think the insurance company gave these out, and then I gave this to myself as a present because it just makes me laugh. But the reason I have these here is today we're going to be talking about the church. And so I wondered if you knew whose church this church that we're sitting in right now is. Who does it belong to? A very, a very old person or God. That's kind of a good, that sounds like kind of a good thing. Well, and I, do you, do you remember when we do communion? You know, I say lots of big words as I ask the Holy Spirit to come and bless the communion elements and help them to make those and us be what God wants us to be in the world. And when I invite people up to the table, do you remember what I say? I can help you if you don't remember. I usually say something like, this isn't my table, and it's not even Alden United Methodist Church's table. It's not even the Methodist Church's table. It's Christ's table, and Christ invites everybody to come and share in Holy Communion, right? And that's kind of what's true of the church. Now, do I go around and say, oh, you should come to my church, right? It kind of makes it sound like it's my church, right? And how many how many people out there sitting in the pews say that? Oh, you should come to my church, or we're going to have a rummage sale at my church, right? We think that it's our church, and you're perfectly fine saying that. But really, what we need to remember is it's not any of our churches. It's not the trustees' church. Sorry, Dorothy, who's our trustee chair. It's... Not the ad board's church. Sorry, Lene. She's our ad board chair. It's not the pastor's church. That's for darn tootin'. It's God's church. And it's God's church through Jesus because Jesus made the church. The church was Jesus' idea for us. And what are we, since we don't own the church, it doesn't belong to us, what are we? We are the church. We have a beautiful building here, and we have wonderful parking. We're the only place in Alden that has parking, right? <laughs> I had somebody apologetically when I was here coming to set the PowerPoint up last night saying, is it okay if we park here to go get ice cream? I'm like, absolutely. 
Uh, but we have a wonderful building here. But this building isn't the church, even though we call it the church. We say, I'm going to go up to church and uh, go eat some cookies with the ladies at uh, the women's group. Or I'm going to go up to church and worship God. But the building isn't the church. We are the church. We are the body of Christ. And so we don't own the church. It doesn't belong to us. We are the church. So it's a kind of an important thing, but it's so confusing because the way we say things about it makes it sound like it belongs to us, right? And we'll get into this in a whole different children's service, but we are to steward the church. We are to take care of the church, which since we are the church, it means we're to take care of each other, right? All right. So that sounds so confusing, but hopefully that made it a little clearer for us. Yeah? We look confused still. We'll work on it. We have the next 80 or so years to figure it out, right, Lillian? All right, so we say the Lord's Prayer and pray the way that Jesus taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen, you may go sit down. So what prayers and praises are on your hearts this morning, church? Addison is having her 21st birthday today, and Jillian had hers two weeks ago. So Addison and Jillian are, they're not both 21. Yes, they are. Oh, they both are 21. Yeah, All right. Two weeks ago and Addison today. So Jillian and Addison had birthdays two weeks ago and today, and so we pray God's blessings on them. For the next many, many years, that uh, they would be wonderful years filled of God's blessings. Lord, in your mercy. <laughs> what other prayers and praises are on your hearts this morning? Darlene? So we praise God for that healing of those burns, and we pray that they will heal even better and even more, and that it will be as painless as possible. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. What other prayers are on your hearts? Laura? I have a good friend that she was diagnosed with a small cell lung cancer, and she's had breast cancer twice, so she knows what it's about. What's her first name? Pam. So prayers for Pam, who's been diagnosed with small cell cancer. And we pray for healing and strength that even as she's consulting with her doctors and starting treatment, that God is at work healing her body and making those cancer cells go away and new and healthy cells grow in their place. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. What other prayers and praises are on your hearts? I have a praise just that how um, we packed this church in today. It's nice. And uh, so we have, you know, probably six people watching at home around, it looks like, because I get to watch here on the screen. But they don't always get to see everybody out there. I thought we could swing the camera around and All right. real quick. Yeah, we I mean, give thanks for our people who worship with us. And show everybody that, you know, show everybody at home all the people that are here today. Wave to them. Just, it was really quick, so don't worry, you're not on TV too long, but people at home don't get to always see all you smiley faces out there. Yeah. All right, so we give thanks for those of us who have come out to worship in person and those who are worshiping with us online. Lord, in your mercy. Yes. Darlene? So prayers of healing for Amber, who's having migraines. We pray that those migraines would go away and that she would find some comfort from them, some healing from them. 
Lord, in your mercy. Serve her. Ruth? For healing and comfort for Mike Henderson. Prayers for healing and comfort for Mike Henderson. We pray that God is at work healing him. Lord, in your mercy. Serve her. I didn't say it before, but June 9th was our 61st anniversary. Whoa. So thank you, Lord, for all these good years. So happy anniversary for your 61st anniversary, and we pray many more wonderful years of marriage for both of you, and we praise God for all those years that you've been together. Lord, in your mercy. What other prayers and praises are on your hearts? Tina? Well, I finally have decided to ask for prayer support. There are several of us in this congregation who are dealing with eye issues, retinal difficulties. And without naming all of us, just I would ask for prayers for God to help us heal these retinas so that we may continue to see and enjoy this beautiful world. So prayers of healing for all those in our congregation who have vision difficulties, especially retina difficulties, but also I think we can pray for everybody in the world who's struggling with vision problems. And we pray God's healing on all of their eyes. We pray God's healing on all of their hearts as they work to adapt. And we pray that God would be clearing their vision and making it easy to see. Lord, in your mercy. What other prayers and praises are on your hearts? <laughs> traveling mercies for all those who are traveling this week and in the coming weeks for the Cherry Festival, for the 4th of July, for all those fun things that are happening. And we pray that all those fun things will be incredibly safe and uh, as one who will be watching fireworks as they're loaded and probably going out to help people who are hurt on Torch Lake, I pray for all of our first responders who will be out there, our police keeping us safe on the roads and out on the boats on the lake. Um, we pray for their safety as well. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. What other prayers and praises are on your hearts? Um, I just want to lift a prayer. I was made aware of uh, somebody in need of prayer who's asked for prayer, who isn't ready to share what that is um, with the public right now because they're waiting to learn some more things. And so... I ask just that you would be praying for this unnamed prayer of need for healing and treatment. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Are there any others? If not, let's go to God in silent prayer, knowing that God knows all that's on our hearts and in our minds. Let us pray. Good and gracious God, we come to you with many requests, many prayers, but also many praises of thanksgiving for how you are at work in the world and in our lives and in our church. God, we pray your healing on those we have named before you and those whose names we hold in our hearts. God, as we pray for healing for people that we know and even people we don't know, God, we pray for healing for our church, healing for our community here in Alden and in Antrim County, wisdom for our leaders in our local community and in our state and in our country and for our leaders across the world. God, we pray your wisdom for them that they might need in ways that would make this earth a place where you would want to be, a place that is your kingdom here on earth. And God, we pray for all those across our country who are 
suffering the after effects of the tornadoes and other natural disasters that we've had in the news. We pray your comfort on those across the world who are suffering from famine and from being in war zones, from all the ways that we are broken as human beings, God, we pray your healing over it all. And God, even as we pray for these great big things, God, we pray for those little small things that we might walk closer to you in our daily worship and walk with you, that our church might be closer to how you would want us to be in the world. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Our hymn, our prayer response is number 393, Spirit of the Living God, who rises morning. the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms, according to his eternal purpose that he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. In him, and through faith in him, we may approach God with freedom and confidence. I ask you, therefore, not to be discouraged because of my sufferings for you, which are your glory. For this reason, I kneel before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power, together with all the Lord's holy people, to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ, and to know this love that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than we can all ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. This is the word of God for the people of God. Let us pray. Loving and holy God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be measured and found pleasing in your sight, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So today we are going to talk about church, if you didn't figure that out from the children's sermon. And that is church with a capital C. That is the body of Christ. Christians and churches everywhere who are gathered together as the body of Christ. And then we're going to talk a little bit about what does it mean to be the church. We're going to talk about what does it mean to be this specific church, Alden United Methodist Church. And we're going to talk a little bit about our vision and what we are hoping to do between now and 2030, which I picked because it's just a nice round number. We talked about like five-year plans and 10-year plans, so we're kind of looking where do we want to be in the next year and couple years, but out towards 2030. 
And by the time I'm done talking, I hope that you will be inspired and thinking, um, gosh, I'm really proud to be a part of this church, and I want to be more engaged with this church, and I want to grow in my faith more. And what we are going to be doing as we move into the future, um, I think some of us don't even know all the great things that this church does in the community. And I'm betting that some of you have great ideas for new things that maybe we should be doing or we could be doing. Um, if you didn't know, Thursday we had kind of a visioning meeting and uh, we gathered together for two hours and it started out a little bumpy, but kind of by the end I felt like we had a good cohesive conversation and it is only the first of many conversations. This wasn't a one and done thing because I think that God is always at work inspiring us. Now, we're going to go back to sort of the beginning of that meeting where it was a little depressing because according to a recent American Enterprise Institute study in partnership with the University of Chicago, they found that Americans are 22% less involved in church after COVID than they were before COVID. So that's church-going Americans. This isn't even talking about the people who don't go to church. And that's about a quarter of the people who were involved in church before COVID are just less involved in church nowadays. And there's a lot of people, I think, out in the world wondering, why do I need a church? Why is church important? And the thing that they found is the people who are most likely to be leaving the church, do you want to guess what that group is? Young people, people under 30, you're right on. And so the group has, that has the largest decline in church attendance is people under 30. But that age group, here's the good news, is still about 40% of the under 30 crowd who report they actively attend church every week, which is kind of fascinating because now what is considered regular church attendance is one time a month, which every time I tell church people that, they're like, what? I thought it was every week you have to be in church. But the people who compile statistics, when they are asking about regular church membership, it is once a month, 12 times a year, which kind of blows my mind, too. And so um, there are 60% of the people in the world who say they are church people who are not involved that much because that 40% group of the under 30s are just the ones who are very involved in church. And those 60% who don't, don't go very much, they're, they're still not going. But that 40% who were regular church attenders in the under 30 crowd, that number's been in decline since COVID. And there's another study done by Gallup that came out last December that said 58% of Americans seldom or never go to church. Maybe Christmas and Easter and that's it. And the Pew Center reported in December of 2021 that while 63% of Americans claim to be Christians, a third of that 63% never go to church. And at least for some people, the church has become less important. And I think that maybe we've forgotten why the church matters. And I want us to know why the church matters and what was Jesus' picture for the church and what is God calling us to do and to be as a congregation. So in 2016, there was a study that was conducted and 66% of youth and young adults stopped going to church when they went to college. Now that's not new, right? I went to college, oh, probably what, 35 years ago here now? And um, I went to Adrian College, and Brother Bob, who was sitting there at our freshman orientation, he told us at freshman orientation that he knew a lot of us, even if we had been regular church attenders up to this point, that, that once we got into college and out from under mom and dad's thumbs, that we would probably worship at St. Mattress on Sunday mornings instead of the college chapel. And honestly, 
here I am up here as a pastor. That was completely true for me for all four years of college. I don't think I once went to chapel on Sunday mornings when I was in college. Now, I did go to church when I went home to visit my family, but I never went to the college chapel. And I went to a Methodist college, even. And um, I know that you guys know this is true because I have had conversations with you, and it was brought up in our visioning thing, that a lot of us have kids and grandkids particularly those who are going off to college age who aren't going to church or who have said, you know, I don't really see a need of why I need to go to church, right? And the, they figured out that there were four main reasons why this demographic group started stopped going to church. The first one they found is kind of the obvious one. They found that, quote, my parents weren't there to make me go to church anymore. Pretty obvious, right? Mom and dad aren't there to wake me up, make me get dressed, and go to church. The second one they gave is that church members seem really hypocritical. That one kind of hurts, doesn't it? <clears throat> and so what young adults value, but I, I don't even think it's young adults. I think what all of us value, what everybody values, is authenticity that we are actually trying to live out what we believe. And I have to tell you, you guys, some of you have mentioned the sign out front that I put, um, be like Jesus, take a nap on a boat. Well, I'm hoping one day to get around to changing it again, and the one I'm going to put next is be like Jesus, challenge the hypocrites, which we'll see how that one goes over. It may not go over as well as taking naps on boats, but we'll see. Um, but I think it's true. We all want people to be authentic, right? We don't want the shiny, highness, tiny society blowing sunshine in our ears when things are awful in the world or in our lives, right? We are there. And so that seems a pretty legitimate reason for, to me. The third reason they said is I don't feel connected with the people in my church. And since COVID, People have drifted away from the people in our church. If we haven't stayed connected through online worship or phone calls to each other or checking in with each other or maybe online Bible study or being in worship in person, we can kind of drift and kind of feel disconnected from them and far from our church friends and maybe even far from God. The fourth reason that was given by these young adults who stopped going to church is, I disagreed with my church on social issues. And those young adults who were polled said, I most often disagreed with my church on issues of gender, race, and same-sex marriage. Which that's a whole nother conversation. And if you've been watching anything about the Methodist church, you also know that is something that we are wrestling with, right? Um, but we're not even going to start to go down that path because that is a whole bigger conversation. But we will have that conversation in the coming weeks and months as we lead up to General Conference, where that is going to be a forefront um, in our bigger church. Um, so what I want us to talk about today is why the church really matters and about God's vision for this church in the years ahead. So let's just start by talking about what is the purpose of the church. So we learned in children's time, right? Jesus invented the church. Oh, he didn't invent the idea of ecclesia, which is the word in Greek that we use for church. But he said, I need a church. This is important to me. And so we get this idea from Jesus that this community matters. The church matters. And when we talk about church, we talk about church as a place, right? I'm going to go run up to church and go help sort things for the rummage sale because we're going to return all that money from the rummage sale back into the community and back to our food pantries and our charities that help women and children, like the Women's Resource Center and all that stuff. So. I'm going to church. It's a location. It's a building, right? That's how we talk about it. And there's nothing wrong with that. Don't, don't hear me picking on you for that because it's how we all do it, not just 
at this church, but probably every other church around the world. It makes a lot of sense to us. But if we look in the New Testament, the church is not a building. And I saw a sign once, and it is just a dynamite sign. It said, when the building burns down and the preacher leaves town, what you have left is the church. Let me read that one again, because it's got to sink in there. When the building burns down and the preacher leaves town, what you have left is the church. I really like that. It's a reminder to us that the church is not the building, and especially the church isn't the preacher or the pastor or even the staff. The church is the people. That's what the church is. And, you know, we learned that in a song when we were children, right, in Sunday school. So in the New Testament, the word that is used for church is ekklesia. And here's your Greek lesson for this morning. Ek means out, and kleo, or klesio, means called. And so <coughs> ekklesia was used long before the New Testament. It was a secular term. And it was calling people out to a special meeting or a special vote or a special gathering in the community in which some important purpose would be worked out. So in the Greek community, people would come out and they would vote on something important or they would hear a special report, and that was ecclesia. But along comes the New Testament, and Jesus refers to his people the church gathered together as the ecclesia. And we're going to kind of cover some scriptures fleshing that out a little bit. But when we hear people say all the time how much they love Jesus, not the church, right? How many of you have had friends or family or somebody say that? I love Jesus, but not the church, right? Or I can be, what do they say, spiritual, but not religious, Right? We've all heard that. I see lots of heads nodding. But <clears throat> I think we read the scriptures and we see Jesus saying, now wait a minute, the church really matters to me. It is church and it is his idea. It wasn't a pastor's idea or even the disciples' idea. The church was Jesus' idea. Jesus thought that it was important. So if you love Jesus, you should love the church too. Although, granted, the church is not always great at being what Jesus wants us to be. Can I get an amen to that? We fall short all the time in our modern world, and certainly we have fallen short through history. You know, the Crusades, where the church stood on slavery. I mean, we could just go all through history in ways... The church, as the body of Christ, has fallen short of what Christ calls us to be. But Jesus thought it was important. And so when we were reading what we are reading in the Bible, when we are reading the Bible, the Bible was meant for these churches. And it was written from churches to churches. It was meant for the body of Christ to be in community, that we need other people. And Faith is not a solo sport. Faith is meant to be lived out in community and by a community of people. It wasn't meant to be something we do alone. Faith is a team sport, if you will. And the writer of the letter to the Hebrews in chapter 10 says, Do not neglect to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day of Christ approaching. And I think this is an important thing in the New Testament, this idea of community, that we bear each other's burdens, that we lift each other up, that we bless one another. And we, it's constantly changing, right? Another person walks in the door of the church, you automatically become a we. You are part of us. We, I, it sounds really bad, and maybe this isn't something I should be saying from the pulpit, but I kind of feel like we're part, we're kind of like the mob. Once you're part of us, you ain't ever getting out because we're going to love on you to your dying day, right? Amen. 
Granted, we have a much better part of that dying day part than the mom, but, but once you're a part of us, we want you to be part of us, and we want to reflect our love in how we treat you and how we gather together. And so, uh, <clears throat> I personally, I need to be with the other Christians. Other Christians, they encourage me, they bless me, they challenge me sometimes. Uh, sometimes they challenge me kind of like Paul's thorn in the side. And sometimes they challenge me by saying something that I had never thought about before. They look at the scriptures in a way that I had never considered. So I love being in community with people of faith and with Christians. And so I come here each week to get my God fix, if you will. And this time in worship, it centers me and refills my cup and refocuses me for the week ahead. And it says that God inhabits or dwells in the praises of his people. I need to be together praising God with other people. I need to serve with other people. I need all those things. I need the church, and it helps me. It helps me to be a better mom, and it helps me to be a better wife, and it helps me to be just a better all-around human being when I am engaged in the church. And don't think this is some holier-than-thou pastor thing. I mean, you guys know me well enough. I am so not a holier-than-thou pastor thing. I have a potty mouth. I screw up more than on occasion. I screw up all the time. I am nowhere near perfect, and sometimes I'm not even near mediocre, right? <laughs> but when I, and I've had lots of times in my life when I haven't been going to church, when I haven't been engaged in the church. I mean, I just told you, four years of my life when I was worshiping at St. Mattress, right? But when I am in and engaged in the church, which means participating, I am just a better person, a better human being, the person that I believe God wants me to be. And so in Matthew 16, 16, Jesus, is at, Jesus asks Peter a question. He says, who do you say that I am? And Peter replies, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Then he says, and I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. And I want you to notice there that Jesus said, on this rock, I will build my church. So Jesus calls it out, and he calls people into it. And Jesus um, intended that there be a church, and it was something important. It was his intention, and not just something that sort of happened. It's not just something that Jesus is going to build. It is something that belongs to him, and he cares about. Now, in our text, case, and we talked about it with Lillian a little bit, it doesn't belong to the bishop. This church doesn't belong to the annual conference. Well, we do belong to an annual conference, but the church's ownership doesn't just belong to an annual conference or to the church trustees who technically have the legal ownership stuff of the church or to the ad board who legally has the deciding what happens in the church kind of things. None of those things are who owns the church. It doesn't belong to the pastor, I'll tell you that one for sure. But the church belongs to Jesus. And really, it doesn't even belong to the people, even though, like, I'm okay with you claiming this is your church, right? The church belongs to Christ, and all of us are Christ's servants. And when we understand that, then we know that our task and our job is to figure out what does Jesus want us to do as a congregation and as individuals. And that's true for every single church, and that's true for the big C, all of us together church. And I'm going to give you another word that's often transliterated for church, and that is cura. I can't always pronounce all these fancy Greek words either. Kyriakos, and it means belonging to the Lord. So the word church means this belongs to God. And also in Matthew 16, Jesus says that this, that this church 
that I am building here, he says, the gates of Hades will not prevail against it, which I think is a pretty powerful statement. Now, if you know a little bit of your Greek history, Hades is the underworld, and it was associated with darkness and death and despair and brokenness and pain. And in the underworld, in Hades, when you die, if you it had a bad, good compartment and a bad compartment, if you were a good person, you wound up in the good compartment. If you're a bad person, you wound up in the bad compartment. Um, and so, that was how the Greeks thought of Hades. And so Jesus is kind of speaking to his audience here when he says this. And he says, the gates of Hades, they are not strong enough to withstand the onslaught of my people when they are gathered together working for my purposes. Jesus is saying we are going to bring healing to people who are broken. And when we are going out to bring hope to those people who are in despair, and when we're going out to announce the good news of the kingdom of God, hell can't stop it. When the church, when God's people are together and not by themselves, and they are doing what I have tasked them with doing. I think it's a different world trying to go out to fight darkness and evil all by yourselves. I mean, we have great Marvel movies that explain about that, but I don't know about you. I tried putting on tights and, you know, spandex once, and that slowed me down as trying to put it on, and going out to jump off high buildings and save widows in distress, and it doesn't work really well for normal people like us, right? I haven't been bit by an atomic spider or, you know, been part of some government uh, test in the 1940s, isn't that Captain America? You know, we... None of us are superheroes. We're superheroes in little ways, right? But not in the Marvel, DC, comics, epic, movie kind of way. But when we are together, we can move mountains, right? We can stop hunger. We as the United Methodist Church were a large part of ending malaria in the world. Just by a whole bunch of silly $10 nets. You guys remember the Imagine No Malaria campaign and getting nets and getting those into people's homes to stop malaria? And so <clears throat> that is what it means to be the church, us working together with other people and doing Christ's purposes. Paul says it this way. He says, you are the body of Christ and individually members of it in 1 Corinthians. So you are the presence of Jesus in the world. He said to his disciples, you know all this stuff I've been teaching you? Now go out and do that. We are to continue Jesus' work. We are incarnating, that is, putting flesh on Jesus for the world today to experience and to know. Now the prophet Ezekiel, back in the Old Testament, he once expressed God's frustration with the church of his day which was the synagogue. Well, it wasn't exactly the synagogue. It was God's people gathered together and built around those temple practices. And so God was frustrated with the shepherds, that is, those religious leaders of Israel, because the religious leaders were only focused on themselves or on their congregations. They weren't looking outside to see who was lost or broken or in despair. And Ezekiel says, For thus says the Lord God, I myself will search for my sheep and will sort them out. As shepherds sort out their flocks when they are among scattered sheep, so I will sort out my sheep. I will rescue them from all the places to which they have been scattered on a day of clouds and thick darkness. I will seek the lost, and I will bring back the strays, and I will bind up the injured, and I will strengthen the weak. So here we are finding out what God wants his people to do, and we can see that Jesus was probably heavily influenced by that passage of Scripture because we can see it in Matthew 9 where it says, Then Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and curing every disease and every sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them, because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. Can you hear Ezekiel in that passage from Matthew? 
I thought so too. And where God says, I will be the shepherd to my people and I will find the lost and the strays. And when you look at Jesus' ministry, you can see he was driven by this mission of finding hurting people, of finding lost people, of the broken people, the people who are walking in darkness. And hello, this isn't just outside the doors of this church. How many of you have been hurting or broken or just feeling lost and alone at some point in your life? Like three of us? I'm pretty sure everybody should have their hand up, unless you are superhuman and should be in one of those DC movies. And even all those superheroes have that feeling too, right? So it isn't just people outside. We and our flock too are struggling and broken. And usually that comes for a season, right? We have a rough go of it. We lose our spouse or a parent or we have parts of our body that don't work the way they worked when we were 19. Imagine that! And so maybe we need a little help from our friends to get through. A little, hey, you've got this, and most importantly, God's got this. And we will be there to be your soft spot to land as the church. And so if all this is Jesus' mission... That has to be our mission. It has to be what we are striving to do, those same things. In Luke, Jesus summarizes his ministry like this. The Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. Now, if we're the body of Christ, if we are the church and we are Jesus' church and we are to incarnate Jesus' work in the world, then we have to have that same sense of vision where we are seeking and saving the lost and we are going to find the people who are broken, where we are going to share the good news of the kingdom so that people walking in darkness will see a great light. It's not meant for us to navel gaze and to be turned inward. It's meant for us to be turned outward, to see the people who Jesus cares deeply about, which we can look around and see that in the church too, right? It's not just out there or just in here. It's all of out here and <clears throat> see those people though that 50 8 percent of the population that no longer goes to church and the percentage of the population that says i don't know if i believe in god anymore and for us to say let's just show them love let's show them the love in a little bit the mission of all the united methodist church is to connect people to christ Go back a slide, Ernie. There we go. The mission of Alden Community United Methodist Church is to connect people to Christ, nurture them to spiritual maturity, and prepare them to go into the world to bear fruit and set a Christian example. And we even go on to say how we're going to do it. We say we will accomplish this by celebrating with heartfelt worship to God, pursuing individual um, Christ-centered growth, being a caring community for all, and using our time, talents, and gifts for God's purpose, and sharing the word of God. Now, when we had our gathering on Thursday, and we're going to talk more about this in more sermons, what we came up with, and we're going to have more conversations, too. But what we came to at the end is we talked about wanting that Alden and the world would look more like the kingdom of God, more like the world, how God created it, where it was perfect and there was love and there wasn't all the brokenness and harm and hurt in the world. And so we're going to make Alden and the world look more by the kingdom, like the kingdom of God, by what we're doing both as individual people who follow Christ and as the church of Christ in the world. Our purpose is to build a community where non-religious and marginally religious people, and even people who have been religious all their lives are becoming deeply committed Christians, along with the rest of us, to live with sacrificial love and to care for the people in our community. We talk a lot about being Christ's hand and feet and I know uh, we're kind of getting to the end of time here, so I'm going to 
wind it up, even though I've got more that we're going to talk about in the coming weeks. But instead of me telling you, I thought maybe some of you could come up with all the ways we are out in the community helping the hurting and those who are struggling or maybe just need a little bit of help. Because when I started listing those off, there's a lot of people who don't know all the things that Alden does in our community. So can you guys name some of them? I can fill in the, the blanks. Mike? I would like to uh, thank the community for uh, challenging me uh, in ways I think they have. And they actually uh, have made me very comfortable as a self. I just want to do that. Well, thank you. We, we uh, pray God's blessing on you and hope that you'll be back to be more about being that love in the world. What other things? The little free food pantry out front. Our neighbors who are maybe are running short on their paycheck can go and stop and grab some food 24-7, right? They don't have to wait for the food pantry hours to pick it up, which kind of leads into the next thing. We support the food pantry in Rapid City, so if our neighbors need to go and get like a whole grocery load to get them through the week, they can go and do that. And we have another feeding ministry. Does anybody know? The voucher system. The voucher system, yeah, that uh, we have for people who, because the food pantry has kind of shelf-stable stuff, and they do have some meat and, and dairy and that kind of stuff now as they get it in, but sometimes there's just dot stuff at the food pantry that people need, um, or it's kind of that in between and they've got more that, can to, that they need to feed their family that can come from our little free food pantry. We give people a voucher to Village Market to go get the things that they need. What other ways are we helping people in our community? Rummage sale. The rummage sale. And, uh, I just briefly went over, I want to say there's like 20 different charities, maybe even more than that, in Antrim County that get a nice little check from us right before Christmas from the proceeds of that uh, rummage sale. And it is thousands of dollars that go out into our community. And it's all the proceeds of that. Uh, what else? We, we sponsor the daycare. We sponsor the daycare. And, and I know pretty much all of you do not have little kids at home in your households. You're, you know, if you do, it's grandchildren and great grandchildren visiting. But it's really hard to find good and affordable child care. Heck, it's even hard to find expensive good child care right now in Antrim County. It is a huge need in our community that we are meeting. And um, it's a place and time for us to influence those little lives. What else? Something a lot of you may not know about is I have a checkbook, as it were. It's the Community Needs Fund. And so when our neighbors maybe are going to get their lights shut off because they lost their job or whatever is going on, or maybe I had somebody I paid to get their tooth pulled because they didn't have the money to do it and they had an infected tooth and... Um, that we, I am able, because we have people who donate to that and some of the money from the rummage sale goes to that, where I can pay consumers power and make sure that this family is going to have heat on to keep their kids warm. Tina? I have a response to the student aid. Yeah, we have a student aid. We have five students every year who get scholarship money to go to college. Um, and that has been going on for years. So there are a lot of people who've gone to college with the help of all the United Methodists. In fact, I have three granddaughters who have benefited from it. And I also benefited from it for one of my, my uh, friends in college as well. Awesome. And so that's the gift that keeps on giving, right? We help people to go to college and be educated, and then they use those gifts for the world. What else? Yeah, 
So people will go and bring in food and check on you and make sure you're all right. And uh, you also have a way to get in and out of your house a little easier, right, Charlotte? Yeah, we built a ramp. And yeah, Char every time I bring it up, Charlotte's like, and I use it all the time. And you know, that's people working together. Lillian? Um, praise for doctors who is helping. Oh, praise for doctors who are helping. Um, all right. So are there any others? Actually, I know there's a lot more stuff, but we're, my husband, He's allowed to get away with it. He was looking at his watch. So I'm going to wind this up, and we're going to have some more conversations about how we can have the vision of who we are going to be in the church for the world in Alden. But will you pray with me? Loving God, we pray that even as we uh, give thanks and praise to you for all the ministries that Alden is able to do, God, we pray that you might guide us and lead us in all the ways that we can be your people in the world, that we can be your church in the world, that we can make Alden in the world look more like the kingdom of God, more like the world as Jesus told us it should be and as you imagined it in creation. God, we ask that you would go with each one of us as we walk out these doors into our mission field, that you would use us and be with us, that you would comfort and fill us up even as we gather together to praise you, and as we gather together to lift and nurture each other who are here in our midst and who are joining us from all the places that people come to worship with us. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, it is time for us to share with God some of the gifts that God has given us and return them to God to do God's work in the world through our morning offering. Praise God from church made of your love and your hope and your peace and your joy. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's join together in our Sunday music. We are the church.
I just wanted to share some of the things that we talked about doing in our visioning. We talked about closing some gaps that we could see. One was closing the spiritual gap by drawing people to Christ and ever growing deeper in their faith, both those of us who are here and those of us who might come. We also talked about the generational gap. I mean, we talk about that all the time here, don't we? Um, and so that we want to reach an increasing number of younger people, young adults, older adults, and children too. Um, and also to fill that kindness and justice gap, you know, where uh, we would inspire people and ourselves to do justice and love kindness and walk humbly with God, to share that love and kindness with the community for all the ways that we help in our community to um, help people, which kind of rolls into this opportunity gap of addressing these real human needs that we've talked about in our community of families and children in poverty and our elderly who are often living in poverty or who are lonely and how we can meet those needs and how we're already meeting some of those needs. And so, those are some of the things that we're going to talk about. And we talked some about how we have a lot of grandparents raising grandchildren in our community, and that might be an opportunity for us. Um, but I just kind of, for those of you who weren't here, give you sort of a direction of where we're going to be going as we talk about this. <clears throat> and so as you go into the coming week, may your roots go down deep into the soil of God's marvelous love. And may you come to know how wide, how long, how high, and how deep God's love for you really is. All glory to God who is able to accomplish infinitely more than we would ever dare to ask or imagine. Go with God and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Amen.